Hey, I'm Matt and welcome to Soil Lab. If you're like me, you're probably really interested in fertilizing and having a healthy lawn, a healthy garden, but you're probably also concerned about doing that sustainably with the environment in mind. What we did was a study to look at nutrient leaching movement, and we also were able to look at some cation exchange processes as well, just to geek out on some soil chemistry. So what did we do to get this study going to make sure that we're fertilizing sustainably? So as we're setting this study up, we added 300 grams of sand to each of these filter cups. We use this sand because it's gonna have a relatively low baseline nutrient and it's gonna really remove variables so that we can really just look at the effects of our additions. So what additions did we use? We used both organic and non-organic fertilizers. The fertilizers we chose were feather meal, urea, ammonium sulfate, as well as calcium nitrate. Those were all applied at the equivalent rate of one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Following that surface application of those fertilizers, we then leached with 150 mils of water, grabbed three samples of leachate from each of these, and then analyzed it using the MySoil Ion Exchange resin capsules. Let's go ahead and dive into the data and see what we learned. After we leached those, the very first number I want to look at is nitrate in terms of parts per million that were leached through. So we leached right at about 117 parts per million of nitrate when we applied that calcium nitrate. Now when we look at the data over the others, you see in our untreated control, the one that received no fertilizer, we got basically no nitrate leaching. This was a really low nutrition soil, which is why we used it, it was really to remove those variables. You can see the feather meal and the urea, as well as the ammonium sulfate, also didn't have any nitrate leaching. Now, why is that? Well, that feather meal hadn't yet converted to ammonium and then nitrate. The urea hadn't converted to ammonium, let alone nitrate. And then that ammonium sulfate hadn't cycled into nitrate either. And that's because we irrigated these in or leached them the day of application. So great, we saw the nitrate move. Now, a lot of us probably understand that's because nitrate is an anion. So an anion is a negatively charged ion. Well, our soil particles are also negatively charged, and so that nitrate repels, stays in the soil water, and moves with it. Now let's go ahead and look at ammonium. That's NH4+. It's a cation, which is a positively charged ion. So in theory, it shouldn't leach very much because it should attach to those soil particles. Remember, this is a very coarse, sandy soil, so it has a low ability to hold and retain nutrients. As we look at the data, though, we see um, that really uh, we did see some leaching, but it was right at 58 uh, parts per million of ammonium that leached through. So that's telling me that a good amount of that ammonium is still sticking in that soil. Now, if we were to replicate this trial in, say, a silty loam soil or a loamy soil, we'd see much less ammonium leached through. Now, we're talking about ammonium and nitrate leaching, and we probably want to know, like, why do we care? Well, one, there's economic reasons, and two, there's ecologic reasons. Uh, we don't want to leach out fertilizer that we've paid for, uh, first off. Second off, we know that leaching of nitrates can contaminate groundwater, can contaminate surface water, and lead to dead zones in the sea, etc. That's called eutrophication. Certainly want to avoid that as well. So we need to be sure we're managing our nutrients within that root zone. Outside of nitrogen, I think it's important to remember what's happening to our other nutrients. Um, as we let's see here, we put out ammonium sulfate. That's a 21.00 with 24% sulfate. So what happened to that sulfate after we leached it? We saw the same trend with sulfate that we saw with nitrate, and that's what we should really expect because it's another anion, SO4 minus two. And in this case, we saw even more sulfate le leached than nitrate. Well, that's because more went out. Uh, we ended up with right about 180, uh, 180 parts per million sulfate that leached through. Now, if I over irrigated or irrigated below the root zone of my crop or my turf grass or my garden, then that wouldn't, that sulfur wouldn't be made available for plant growth and development. What was really fun about this study is when we measured this leachate with the MySoil test, we not only saw what was leached, but we also got to see different cation exchange interactions. Um, and that's really the beauty of these ion exchange resin tests is they're so sensitive to those small differences. So now let's go ahead and jump in and talk about some of these cation differences that we saw in that leachate. First, we'll look at calcium. Now, typically calcium's pretty sticky. It's a plus two charge, it's a cation, it has a really strong attraction to soil particles. But when we put this much of it in a sandy soil, it did leach out. And so you can see here in our calcium nitrate, 
We leached well over 160, 170 parts per million calcium. But the question that I have is, well, when we applied ammonium sulfate, which doesn't contain any calcium, why did we see calcium leached out? And that's where we can start to talk about these cation exchange processes. All of our cations in the soil are always seeking balance, but really never achieving balance, a lot like me and my work-life balance, probably. Um, but what happened here is we skewed the balance by applying a whole bunch of ammonium, and there wasn't that much ammonium on the exchange sites. So as it was trying to reach balance, it actually kicked calcium off the exchange sites and we were able to leach that out and capture it. Well, does that happen with other cations as well? Yeah, it certainly does. So let's go ahead and look at potassium and magnesium as well. Now this soil was pretty low inherently in potassium and you can see that in the untreated control. It was only about two parts per million, just over two parts per million potassium that was leachable. We see basically the same numbers in our feather meal and urea. So baseline potassium is pretty low. But when we applied that ammonium or the calcium, we kicked off an additional two parts per million potassium, which were absorbed to those exchange sites, which makes really good sense if you remember us talking about that balance. So this is just proving to us um, that our soil tests showed that balance of potassium in the soil and on the exchange sites, and we were able to kick it off using ammonium sulfate and calcium nitrate. At the risk of saying the same thing again, let's go ahead and look at magnesium. Basically, we track and see the same trends that we saw in potassium, but we were able to kick it off uh, a little bit more with the calcium uh, than the ammonium sulfate. So what we're seeing here is live evidence of that cation exchange that's happening. So once we apply a cationic product, it's gonna skew the balance of available nutrients or leachable nutrients in the soil. I think one thing to remember is we're in a pure sand here. In most of our medium textured, say more silty soils, we're gonna see much less leaching than we see here because there's more exchange sites in that soil to hold, exchange, and retain um, our cationic nutrients. Most soils do have a net cation exchange capacity, but they do have definitely the ability to somewhat hold our anions as well, like nitrate and sulfate, but the soils are generally going to have a net cation exchange capacity, so we tend to see predominantly anions being leached out. Well, that's all the data I have for you today. Thanks for following along and better understanding how we can fertilize responsibly based on that knowledge of how nutrients move in the soil. If you enjoyed this data, please like, subscribe, comment what you'd like to see next, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon in the lab.